So I was at a mutual friend's house. Um, we were going to attend a firework party. I was um, working at a friend's dad's house doing some uh, jobs for him, some building works. And I was, um, it was in the afternoon, about two o'clock. I had a phone call and I was at home with my three children. So the day that Nikki had gone into hospital, the day it happened, she had just come out of prison because she was caught stealing. So she'd come out of prison and the next day they'd gone off to score some drugs and then they were going to Ikea. She had a list in her bag of all the things she was going to buy from Ikea. She'd just come back. I just spoke to her on the phone and she just sounded so happy and all that. And just, just, I can still remember the conversation, I love you, can't wait to see you tomorrow. But... That never happened, did it? I do have memories from that day because between the 5th and the 10th we'd always have a bonfire party for fireworks night. Big party, it was our big get together every year. All getting ready, it's all going off, it was always hosted at our house. Um, my cousins were over, everyone was over, it was just like such an exciting weekend for us kids. And I remember the phone rang. Stating that Nikki had been rushed to hospital and um, it was bad. Obviously the party was cancelled and I should really come straight away. Nan phoned up and said um, she'd had a call, Nikki had um, overdosed. She said, don't panic, it's not really that, this should be okay, just get to me and we'll get straight to the hospital. I never answered the house phone as a kid, but I remember so clearly I picked up the phone and there was like quite a professional lady kind of voice. I could tell being a child that there, it was quite different. It seemed like there was some urgency to her voice, like, can I speak to Mrs. Ramsey? And my nan's name is not Ramsey. That's my mum's last name and my uncle's last name. And I remember so clearly, I just was like, I gave my nan the phone. I was like, it's about mum. And I remember holding the phone to my chest like that and my heart just sinking and just feeling so helpless. I left the friends and drove directly to Chase Farm Hospital. You know, the severity of the situation was um, obvious. The whole family were there. Now, Nikki always said to me that if she ever started to use needles, she would be dead in three months. But unbeknown to us, she had started injecting. She'd come out of prison and then gone straight back onto injecting again. She'd been in prison for three months and she did this injection, this speedball. Speedball, what it is, you put the heroin in first into the spoon. To break down the heroin, you have to use like a, um, a citric acid. You can't just put heroin in a spoon and cook it up. So you put the citric acid in, you cook the heroin up, it goes into a brown liquid. Then you have a filter, so you have a cigarette on earbud. But then what you do is with the speedball, before you put the filter in, you get the piece of crack and you put it into the warm liquid and it, and it evaporates into it. So obviously you've still got your brown liquid, but you've got heroin and crack in there together. And then you eject yourself. Then what happens is first, the crack will hit you first, because it's an upper. So you inject it, the crack hits you, and you're like five minutes all over the gaff, your heads, and then it wears off, and then sort of the heroin then kicks in a little bit. It hit her, she went forward, then she went back in her seat, and that was it. She was out cold. Nikki was not moving. She didn't have her eyes open. It really was apparent that something terrible had happened. On arriving at the hospital, it was... It was probably a lot worse than we thought it was going to be because of pipes and everything coming out of her. She was in a terrible way. She wouldn't stop fitting. They didn't know how to stop her. They was on the internet trying to find drugs to stop her from fitting, and it was the most awful thing I've ever seen. Watching her fight for every breath was just the worst thing ever. And as I walked in, her eyes opened and rolled back, and I thought, oh, she, her eyes are open, but her eyes never opened again. That was the last time she ever opened her eyes. They got it to a, a level where she was just laying there. I was like, oh, Nikki. I can't believe that we're here. You don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do. Even the people that love the person the most, you're just sitting there looking at each other, thinking, what can we do? And of course, the, the question is, you can't do anything. You know, it's out of your hands and you're just in the lap of the gods waiting to see if we're going to be lucky and our loved one is going to pull through, or whether we're not. So, the five days was the five.
five hardest days of my whole family's life, I believe. Every night I'd go up there, every night. Once everyone had gone home, just sit and hold her hand. But just look at her, it was just too much looking at her fighting for every breath, it was just so hard. I always thought Nikki would come round, Nikki would come to her senses. She'd be back in the fold, she'd be back with us, she'd be back being our friend, or not their friend, you know, she, she would just sort it out. But, you know, sadly it wasn't to be. So the next day on the Sunday, we all went back to the hospital and they told us that she was brain dead and she was never going to wake up again, but her body was still working. So she was still breathing and we just had to wait until the body gave up. And I remember going up alongside of her and just giving her a kiss. And I think I said to her, you know, I don't think I said goodbye. I think I just said I loved her. And I did think to myself, you know what, as, as, as difficult as life had become for her, she still looked really good. We all decided that she wasn't going to be left on her own. We'd take it in turns to be with her. Just sat with her and it was, it was awful. It was awful because you know she's never coming back, but she's still there. Got a call early one morning to say that the time was very close and we should all be there. So we all made it to the hospital and we all sat in the room and she quite peacefully passed away. That was the end of it, really. <sighs> that was really hard. <laughs> We washed her because we didn't really want the nurses to do it. We wanted to do it ourselves. We thought it was what we should do. That happening to Nikki really woke me up about what was going on with me. And I remember going to the funeral, the funeral wake, I should say. I acted as though it was a party, <coughs> not a wake. And it was a very important part of my recovery when I got clean and sober. My problem wasn't really drugs so much as alcohol, really. I had a real problem with alcohol. And that spiked after Nikki died. But when I did my recovery work, I made my amends to two people on that day. And the first one was Nanny. And I went and I made amends to Nanny. And to you, Sid. And I've stuck with it. And I remember I knocked on the door and I was so nervous. I knocked on the door and you had all the pictures out. It was like you were, and you opened the door and she went, Sarah, please make it be good news. And I went, it is. Can I come in? And I made my amends to Nanny and to you and to you, Joel, for partying went, really, you'd lost your mum, and you'd lost her girl. I wanted to say how beautiful she was, really, when I first met her. Always tanned, bright green eyes, really bubbly, shy, but really endearing and sweet and great company. Um, she was a lovely girl. Most of these are from when she was in prison. I'm sorry I took your car without asking. I'm going to tell you the truth. I took the car from last Wednesday and the dog come with me. I'm very sorry, I won't do it again, love, Nikki. <laughs> so she had a good up... some funny ones. She had a good upbringing. She knew right from wrong. She was really funny. She was so really funny. funny oh. Sorry if I upset you, Mum. I just want to say I love you. The one says, to my darling Sydney, Mummy just wanted to write to you to tell you how proud... Oh. I know. It's hard, isn't it? That's why I got. You do it. <laughs> to my darling Sydney, Mummy just wanted to write to you to tell you how proud I was when I came to see you in the show last week. You were so good, darling. I couldn't wait till the next one. I can't wait till the next one. Your dancing has come on so much since the last time I saw you. I will be coming over to watch your, your swimming too very soon. But mummy has had to go away again for a while. 
I will write to you and talk to you in, on the phone soon. Love you very, very much from your mummy. We made sure that everything in your life that you've done, she was part of, whether it be dancing, swimming, everything you've done, um, birthday parties, Christmases, we always got back and shared time with her, special time. Mm -hmm. Um, Joel's one was to my darling Joel, Mummy is sorry she couldn't see you on your birthday, but Nanny told me you had a lovely time. So when Mummy sees you next, she will have some more presents for you. If you have, have if you've been a good boy, that is, um, will you sit down with Sydney and draw me a lovely picture or send me some of your schoolwork, darling? Love you so much. Love from Mummy. Big hugs for Nanny at the bottom. This is a card that um, I think Mum. She'd done calligraphy, a calligraphy course. My best friend, because she always said that you're not only my mum, you're my best friend. You're the one I feel close to, no matter what the distance is between us. You're always, you're always there to listen when I need to talk. You're the one I can share all my secrets with and trust you above all others. I love you, mum. Because it's funny, really, we, we had that sort of relationship. Although we were distant, um, I accepted the fact in the end that what Nikki was, and I asked her to make me understand how she felt. Um, and when she explained it, how she felt, I, it made me understand more that now that she'd experienced that feeling, she wanted to come back into my world and her children's world, but she couldn't do it. Didn't you say she explained what it felt like? Yeah. I said, how do you feel when you... Because this was a heroin thing. Because heroin was a dirty drug at one time. And, um, and when I said to her, I can't believe that you, you know, you're doing so much heroin. I said, what is it that's so special? She said, well, when you first take it, Mum, you're ill. You, I, I felt sick. I thought, I'd never touch it again. I said, so why did you? She said, because you see other people doing it. She said, and all I can say is it's like having a big, warm glow around you and it makes everything inside feel nice and lovely. I did try to get close and I did accept what we had. And I always used to say to her, your children are going to come back to you one day and I'm, I'm going to make sure that they're well behaved, well balanced and we'll all have a good time together. Hello baby, how is the best girl in the whole wide world? Mummy loves Sydney, Mummy loves Joel. She did love you. She did, I know she did. People used to say, well, she can't love them very much because she keeps pissing off and taking drugs. But I knew she felt, felt that they, you were safe with me in the end, which maybe didn't help her that much. But then even if they'd have been in care, it wouldn't have changed it. I don't, I don't think so at that particular time. She was too hooked. Other parents are going through what I've been through and it's probably my worst nightmare. But I had a wish that I couldn't help Nikki in the end and I did try, I did everything. I had a wish that... I would look after her children and bring them up to be well-balanced children. And that's what I would do for her, the last thing I would do. And this is probably why we're talking about it now, because Sydney's grown up now, very proud of her. Joel's grown up now, so, so proud of him as well. I can't ask for much more. This is where we are now. So, as we're sitting here now, and I'm, I'm talking to you, um, what would you say just if you, in very few words of how you feel this moment now, doing what we're doing. <laughs> I know. Come on, sorry, maybe I shouldn't have asked you to do that. That is why I've kept every, I've told you everything when you were eight, old enough. I wouldn't tell you when you were very young, but as you've got a little bit older, I've always said to you, there's nothing I won't tell you and I'll never lie. It is hard. I think it's hard as I'm getting older. Yeah, I'm, of course. I'm getting to the age where, like, I know she... Like, I'm almost the age where she had me. Mm. Um, so you can put yourself in that position, yeah. Yeah. And this is why you've made the choice to live your life the way you do. And, I don't know, I think maybe seeing all the home videos for the first time in so long, it's like, I don't think I've seen them since I was really young and... You still don't... I, I, in my head as a kid, you look at the videos and you're like, I know that's my mum. Everyone's told me that's my mum because obviously I've got very few memories. But now I'm like... You see her, like you said, as a moving human being. I know. I'm just having a glass of water. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, there we go. <laughs>
How are we getting on? <laughs> no stories. Your mum's prime example. Yeah. Some good will come out of that. Yeah. You know, your mum's story will save lives. You sharing it on your platforms or wherever, whatever's going to happen from this. You know, will save lives. What a beautiful thing, eh? Right, there are 15 candles. We're going to light a, a candle each for 15 years since Mum passed away. Yeah, we've all got one. My granddad's birthday, my mum's birthday, their anniversaries, we always let off balloons just to mark the celebration. And we always say, something we've been told since we were little is like that when loved ones pass away, like the, the brightest star in the sky. So we're letting off the balloons to go up to heaven. And that's just something we've done since we were so young. And that's a tradition I don't think we'll ever stop. Bonfire night, obviously, because that was the night when she was rushing us, but we used to have a bonfire for her and all that in her memory and release lanterns and things. Which is nice, the way everyone comes together and remember. Yeah, it's really nice. Brings the family together. Yeah, yeah, everyone unites together, yeah, it's lovely. We are one of the closest tight-knit families I know, I'd say. Like, I could not go a day without speaking to Nan, 100%. And that right? Mm. Lee started his marathon. He started running many years ago. He's always been a marathon maniac. Crazy. My memories of Lee is like, cigarette. Maybe two bottles of beer in the hand at one time, normally at four o'clock in the morning. When he started taking it really seriously and dedicating runs or dedicating runs to charities, I was blown away, I really was, you know. He runs a lot for the charity Action on Addiction, which is a charity that works alongside addicts and also families grieving. Yes, Lee! So technically, if it's what he said, he'll be coming back round in about half an hour because it's about a three mile lap. The, the running, yeah, it's a million percent. Even doing the ones a day, it's just it's, it's a roller coaster of emotions. One minute you'd be laughing about it, and then it can hurt sometimes running 26.2 miles and so, sometimes when it hurts, I, I just think of Nikki and just the thought of it is nothing. It's just almost like she's patting me along. I know she's there with me doing it. But yeah, it's definitely doing the 54. It's, it's, it's good, I've enjoyed it. It's been tough all year, but you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, yeah. This year he's doing a marathon every single Sunday in memory of my mum and he's kind of linked it with his 50th. So 50 marathons in the year of his 50th and they're all in memory of my mum. We're all so proud of him. Well, what it was, I had all these race numbers. Those all tucked away in a box. And I had a picture of my sister that I randomly thought, if I stuck that in the middle, this is all my reasons for running. Every time I've done a marathon, like the last one I've done last weekend was marathon number 46. They kind of give you the numbers of actually what marathon I was doing for the year. That's 46 on that one. And I think there's a, that was the 21st one from Zigzag Running Group. And a lot of these London ones, where Nikki liked to spend a lot of the time when she was out and about around London and all that. Every London marathon, all for her. It's just a nice way to put things up and remember her. And even last year, which was a week after her birthday, I got the race number, which was actually her date of birth, which was amazing at the time. And how random was that? And yeah, that's why I've kept them all. A little reminder. Sydney's wanted to do this for quite some time now. She wanted me to write a book, and I didn't think I could do it. And I didn't think I could do what I'm doing now. But I've always had chats with my grandchildren and told them about what happens with drugs but I just think now if if this if people watch this and they get their kids to watch it teenage kids and they see some of the bad things that have happened we've tried to make some good things along the way because my daughter was a mum if one or two people look at it and it makes them go away and think oh shit I'm not going to take the drugs it might happen to me then it will be worth it it will be worth it because this is not something I like doing, to sit here and... Um, but it's important to Nikki, to Sydney, because, you know, she's lived through losing her mum and me telling her everything. So I think we'll, we'll all gain from it and lots of other people will. I'm so grateful for this. I know my family will love having this as a timeline and as like a journey to watch back and it's something that we'll be able to have forever. And also the main part being 
I hope that it's just gonna open so many people's eyes and just make people stop and think and be like, ah, it can happen to people, it can kill people. So what you've got to remember is what you're gonna do in the future going forward, do you think you're gonna save lives? We ain't gonna stop here, we're gonna save lives between us. You know? So as a result of what your mum went through and sadly she passed away, lives will be saved because of your mum's story. Fact, fact. This ain't no like tragedy ending to something. This is the start of something good and the legacy for your mum to go off and save many, 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 many lives.